all looked very surreal between the excitement and the jubilation of these uh, civilians who had managed to put enough pressure on the military to depose the dictator, Omar al-Bashir. But at the same time, there was these men with guns were surrounding the site and looking at these people. And I was staying in a hotel in downtown Khartoum at the time, and I used to spend hours in that sit-in site. But outside the entrance that will lead you to the residence of where Omar al-Bashir used to live, there were these two Chinese made four by fours parked outside, and each vehicle had four men. And you pass by these vehicles every evening, and you see these vehicles are parked, and you can imagine they're facing each other with about two or three meters apart, literally 10 meters outside the main gate that takes you to this part of the headquarters. And these were white European men dressed in civilian clothes with machine guns, Russian, you know, like the Kalashnikov, there are high advanced versions of the Kalashnikov that are not like the average AK-47 that you see, but more smaller and more compact. And there was no Sudanese soldiers near them. There were no security people were there. They were an authority unto themselves. And that was very weird. And I was like, okay, so interesting. The rumored Wagner operatives that were in Khartoum were at that particular moment playing for all to see, sitting in that position. I kept on driving past that position for that first week I was in Khartoum because I was also reporting on the whole story to the BBC. And there were moments when me and my colleagues were like, who are these guys? What are they doing here? And why are they sitting like this with guns on their laps, visible for all to see? So who are these people? And what are they doing in Khartoum, the capital of Sudan in northeast Africa? Well, just under three years later, in February 2022, an investigation revealed the answer. Welcome to Deep Dive from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. I'm Jack Megan Vickers. And this is The Wagner Group in Sudan. Part 1. Who are these guys and what are they doing here? Now, I'm sure many of you saw this video from mid-September last year as it was all over the news. It shows a man in green military fatigue standing in the middle of a circle of men all dressed in dark uniforms. The guy in the middle is tall and bald and he's addressing the crowd. I represent the private military company Wagner, maybe you've heard of it. The people surrounding him are not military, but prisoners. The person in green is a man called Yevgeny Prigozhin. And unless you've been living under a rock, you probably know that he's the head of a private military company called the Wagner Group. In this video, he was promising pardons to Russian prisoners if they spend six months fighting for Wagner in Ukraine. If they survived, they would be free. The reason this video is so important is that up until mid-2022, Prigozhin had denied any involvement in Wagner. I mean, he'd even taken an investigative journalist to court in the UK over this, despite being am, under sanctions. I know amongst time. many honourable members here, enormously grateful to Jim Fitzpatrick for the courage that he has shown in bringing together a story yeah. that actually shows that this country is providing sanction waivers for warlords. We have gr given the green light uh, for uh, Putin's chef, Prigozhin, to hire London lawyers to fly to St. Petersburg to prepare a case in English courts to silence English journalists. I have gone through the email traffic um, that is the background to this story, and it has lawyers, some based in London, debating how to attack Elliot Higgins, not Bellingcat, because of course the individual is always more vulnerable uh, than the company. How are they going to make sure that the assets are assessed so that maximum damage can be done uh, to Bellingcat? And we gave the green light for those lawyers to fly to St. Petersburg in order to have that conversation. Indeed, for a while, the whole narrative around Wagner has been one of denial that it even existed. But just a week or so after this video, Prigozhin finally admitted that he'd founded the Wagner Group back in 2014. Needless to say, the case against the journalist was dropped. 
So who is this man, Yevgeny Prigozhin? I'll try and keep this really short. Prigozhin is incredibly wealthy. He's been connected to the Russian President Vladimir Putin for some time. His wealth came from a series of contracts he developed either within the defence industry or by providing meals and services through a business operation called Concord. This is why he's often dubbed Putin's chef in the media. He also runs or controls a company called the Internet Research Agency. Yes, that's the same internet research agency that became infamous for its online troll factory or troll farms that swamped social media sites with misinformation and disinformation. It was during the Russian-backed rebellion in Ukraine in 2014 that evidence first emerged of pro-Kremlin troll factories filled with bloggers like Ludmila Savchuk, paid to spread false information online about the conflict. They were even caught on camera. In this office building in St. Petersburg, an army of trolls, secretly filmed by a former employee, spent 12 hours a day, according to Savchuk, praising the Kremlin and berating its enemies in blogs. The Internet Research Agency was a troll farm, a sock puppet army of fake online accounts and automated bots spreading synchronized talking points. Today, Facebook and the independent cybersecurity firm Graphica say members of that agency created a new site, Peace Data, which bills itself as a global news organization. Its stories are designed to criticize Biden from the left to steer possible voters away from his campaign. It was also hostile to Trump, revealing the main Russian goal remains the same. So division. In 2014, he went on to found Wagner, as we said, and the rest is history. Since the full-scale Russian invasion of Ukraine, the Wagner Group went from shadowy mercenary outfit to almost exhibitionist in its public profile, with Prigozhin making regular social media appearances and the company opening the doors to a shiny new headquarters in St. Petersburg. The Wagner Group has spent much of the war in Ukraine stuck around the city of Bakhmut in Donetsk, as Ukrainian forces have put up a determined defence against the invaders. But this episode isn't about Wagner in Ukraine although its actions elsewhere have a direct influence on that conflict. No, this episode will focus instead on Wagner's operations in Sudan. Russian troops are closing in on the capital. Their military vehicles have been filmed entering the city. And in the last few hours, multiple explosions have been reported. Exact figures are unknown, but there are reports of large numbers of Ukrainian casualties, both military and civilian, since the invasion began, and of Russian military deaths. Streams of people in cars So I think the best foot place foot to start is with from a story. Poland, Romania, As Ukrainians Hungary, desperately defended their country against the full-scale Russian invasion in February 2022, officials handed out weapons to civilians, asking them to fight for the survival of Ukraine. Thousands of miles away, on another continent, these images were flashing across a TV screen at the Khartoum International Airport. At the same time, a Russian cargo plane was taking off, apparently carrying cookies, at least according to the consignment manifest. It was heading to Latakia, the Syrian port city, where Russia have a major airbase. An inspection of this unusual cargo had taken place not a common occurrence with other Russian planes. They often get waved through. But as CNN said at the time, Sudan rarely, if ever, exports cookies. So this time, officials did board the plane, and they found boxes and boxes of cookies. Hmm, what do you know? But beneath the facade revealed something else. Wooden crates. And these crates were full of gold around one ton of gold. You see, the aim of this podcast is to show how Wagner have expanded into Sudan and Africa more broadly, how it positioned itself within the gold mining business, its use of complex corporate structures, how it operates in the grey area between legal and illegal, and how all this helps finance its operations in both Africa and Ukraine. There's been gunfire and explosions in Sudan's capital, Khartoum, as the Sudanese army clashes with paramilitary forces. Witnesses report the fighting is close to the army headquarters in the centre of the city. Before getting into this podcast, over the weekend, violence broke out between two of the main protagonists in this story. 
the Sudanese Armed Forces, or SAF, and the Rapid Support Forces. This clip was from Sudanese state television, and you can hear the gunshots as the Rapid Support Forces entered the building, took control and cut the live feed. Since that point, according to a doctor's union, nearly 100 people have been killed and over a thousand injured. Both those numbers will rise as this plays out. Over these two episodes, we'll try and paint a picture about why there is tension between these two powers, tension which has boiled over. And this actually all goes back to the popular uprising in Sudan. While the rest of the region had been experiencing an Arab Spring, al-Bashir had faced little political unrest until late 2018 when the government decided to triple the price of bread. It triggered protests nationwide and calls for his resignation as they accuse him of mismanaging the economy, sending food prices high and causing regular fuel shortages. Omar al-Bashir would have served as president until the end of his term next year. But now he'll be remembered as one of the last remaining African strongmen brought down by a people's uprising. Omar al-Bashir controlled Sudan for 30 years before being ousted in 2019. Two years previously, in November 2017, Wagner's operations in the country began after al-Bashir signed some cooperation agreements with Russian officials. These focused on oil, arms and nuclear energy. But it also proposed a possible Russian military base at the port of Sudan, which commands an important strategic position on the Red Sea. And then they agreed to mutually support one another in international forums like the UN. Granted, it's a different government in Khartoum now, but it's interesting that Sudan have consistently abstained in the UN votes relating to the Ukraine war. Anyway, within these agreements was the name of a company. M. Invest. It was granted gold mining concessions. It was shortly after this agreement was signed that the first 100 Wagner mercenaries showed up in the country and they immediately got to work via M. Invest. They actively supported al-Bashir's increasingly precarious presidency by offering a range of nefarious services like disinformation, advice on suppressing pro-democracy protests, and even suggesting public executions of looters be held. This is Khaloud Khair, the founder and director of Confluence Advisory, which is a think tank in Khartoum. We heard that Wagner was helping Bashir come up with public relations campaigns, for example, by putting rainbow flags, photoshopping them into pictures of protests and demonstrations, trying to cast the protesters as a sort of foreign, inorganic presence in Sudan, um, as if, you know, LGBTQ issues aren't in Sudan organically. But it's those kinds of things that Wagner and Bashir, clearly coming from the same very similar line of thinking, were working together to achieve. Obviously, this fell flat because something that both Wagner and Bashir didn't appreciate clearly is just how much anti-Bashir sentiment there was. Now, you might ask what M-Invest is and how it relates to Wagner. Well, M-Invest, alongside another company called M-Finance, are at the centre of a complex web of corporate entities that make up Yevgeny Prigozhin's empire. An article in The Guardian about Prigozhin interviewed a businessman who knew him in St. Petersburg back in the 90s. He said that Prigozhin was driven and talented and won't shrink from anything to get what he wants. And this was clearly demonstrated when al-Bashir was removed by popular uprising, because given the support Wagner through M-Invest had given to al-Bashir, this could have been a short-lived endeavour into Sudan. But I think Wagner was actually very quick to change tack after Bashir's fall, and has been less invested in supporting ideologues in government, and it's gravitated much more towards the RSF, which is a non-ideological entity that is much more transactional, much more financially based, much more able to function within the same sort of modalities that Wagner is able to. And therefore, there is much more of a, a sort of a sustained engagement between the two of them. But also, I think they, they calculated that a presence like the RSF could survive 
other bouts of anti-regime, anti-Islamist protests, which to some extent has proven true because, of course, the RSF is still with us. The Organised Crime and Corruption Reporting Project revealed that just days after Bashir was removed from power, a company jet arrived back in Khartoum from Moscow. Off stepped Gamal Omar, who was to become the Minister of Defence, and then Mohammed Hamdan Dagalo, better known as Hermeti, the commander of the Rapid Support Forces, RSF. Hermeti is a key player in this story. Oh, and the jet that they flew on was owned by a Prigozhin affiliated company that had been placed under US sanctions in September 2019. The result of these meetings was an agreement to adhere to the previous established military agreements. Within days, Prigozhin and Wagner had pivoted, adapted, and forged a new pragmatic relationship with the new ruling elite. Here's Ken Opala, the field network coordinator for East and Southern Africa at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. It's very interesting you're asking this question because during the research for the report, I spoke with a human rights advocate who was based in Tafur. And he told me this, to make headway in Sudan, and if you are a potential investor, you must have to know the big people in authority, and in this case, the military. And Russians understand this, understand, this, understand the, the opportunity presented by a patronage. So the main objective of the Russians in Sudan is not to protect the Khartoum political power, but essentially to benefit immensely from the country's mineral resources. So Russians are ready to support any government in Khartoum that gets in power. You remember when um, President Omar Bashir fell out of favor with the citizens and he was ousted. The Russians moved fast to support the new regime. A second military coup followed just two years later and the country is now run by a sovereign council. Hameti is now the deputy head of this ruling council. Two days after Russia launched its full-scale invasion of Ukraine, Hameti visited Russia to reaffirm the relationship between the two countries. Here's Kholud Kher. What we have seen is that, for example, General Hemeti, who is, of course, both a competitor to, Gen- to General Burhan and the Islamists, but also a partner, also seen him do quite well out of it as well. And that's because he has cultivated his own relationship with Wagner. That is, to some degree, seems to be quite independent of Wagner's relationship with the Sudan Armed Forces and its sister bodies. And so Wagner has now sort of really entrenched itself, I would say, through the gold sector, across Sudan security landscape. Now, we should probably talk about the Rapid Support Forces, the RSF, the paramilitary group that Hameti commands. They've been around for a decade and were formed to fight rebel groups in Darfur, which is in the west of Sudan. But led by Hameti, they've also been accused by a number of organisations like the International Criminal Court and Amnesty International of massacres, rape and war crimes. A report from Human Rights Watch in 2015 interviewed victims of an RSF attack, including a young woman who described the horrific attack. She said, They killed my father. My father was defending us so that we would not be raped, and he was beaten to death. After they killed my father, they raped the three of us, me and my two sisters. After they raped us, they stole everything. In addition to that, according to the Organised Crime Index, the RSF have links to other mafia-style groups in Sudan. In June 2019, just months after al-Bashir had been ousted, according to Human Rights Watch, ongoing peaceful protesters were attacked by the RSF, who opened fire and killed 120 people and injured 900 others. So this group have a reputation for extreme violence. But remember that they are a paramilitary organisation. Although connected to the state, They are an independent organisation, and this reputation goes back even before the RSF's official formation, because they were born out of another militia group, known as the Janjaweed. Here's Mo Hashim, a freelance Sudanese journalist currently working at the BBC. If we go back, for your listeners, early on in in the 2000s, war erupted in the western region of Darfur in Sudan, at that time, Omar al-Bashir was involved in peace talks with the then South Sudanese rebels who were under the umbrella of the late Dr. John Garang. And because Khartoum was trying, at that time, Omar al-Bashir was trying to reach peace in the South, 
the start of the rebellion in Darfur was some sort of, uh, they saw it as part of um, something that could undermine their efforts in the South. They unleashed a counterinsurgency campaign, Alex Diwal famously coined as counterinsurgency on the cheap. And what happened is that there was huge mobilization of tribesmen along ethnic lines, and uh, infamous Janjaweed were unleashed. These were thought to be tribesmen on horseback carrying machine guns. Uh, a campaign of attacking mainly for and Zarao villages started. Things became complicated. But this Janjaweed triggered were alleged to have been uh, behind the horrible things that happened in Darfur in the early 2000s, which ultimately was designated as a genocide by the United States State Department. And in 2008-9, Amr al-Bashir was indicted for genocide in Darfur by the International Criminal Court. Hermeti was a commander in the Janjaweed before splitting away with thousands of fighters. This force under Hermeti was then brought in as an auxiliary force to the Sudanese military under the name the Rapid Support Forces, which has grown to be a power unto itself since the revolution of 2019. Part of the current disagreements between the two sides is related to the incorporation of the RSF into the Sudanese military, demanded by both the army and pro-democracy groups. Now, I think it's important to understand that the independence that the RSF has causes a lot of tension with the Sudanese armed forces. Tension that exploded this weekend, including Sudanese military brandishing the RSF as rebels who spread lies. Hameti came back at Al Burhan and during an interview with Al Jazeera called the leader of Sudan a criminal, devious, and a liar, a corrupt man, a thief who destroyed Sudan. This antagonism goes deeper than the immediate political situation. It's built on a mentality. These two powerful forces come from very different parts of Sudanese society. Justin Lynch, a researcher and author of Sudan's Unfinished Democracy, can explain. I was in West Darfur in the summer of 2021, and this is an area that had seen huge conflict over the previous year. And it was an area that had a big displacement camp that had perhaps 30,000 people uh, who were from the uh, non-Arab tribes. And I remember speaking to one of the people in this village, and he was an RSF soldier. And there had been a recent attack on this displaced population that had caused the entire village to move. The village had been burned down. There were, I think, a couple hundred people who had died. And so I was asking him, you know, like, what happened here? And what really struck me was this sense of victimhood that the RSF soldier felt about himself and the Resigat community. The way that he described it was that there had been an argument in the local market and one of his cousins had been murdered. And so because of that, the RSF and he was involved in this responded by torturing this entire village, killing people, and really in what what would be described as a war crime, right? And he wasn't hiding this at all, right? He was just a very matter of fact, this is what we did. You know, there was this argument that took place. We responded by burning this entire village and by killing people because, you know, that's what he described and what he thought of as being fair and as a proportionate response. So the broader point here is that the RSF and the troops themselves feel a sense of victimhood. And in some ways, they do have a logic because in Darfur, these Arab groups have always been looked down on from the riverine elite who are from the center of the country, who have always ruled Sudan. You know, the Arabs have always been viewed as a lower caste. And so their worldview is very much a sense of victimhood that they're always being blamed for things. And this example, I think, it really struck me because it showed how quite obviously there was you know, one group 
uh, that had been the victims here, right? There was 30,000 people who had lost their homes. There was just miles and miles and miles of burned down homes, burned down villages. And, and still this RSF soldier felt like he was the victim, right? And I think that speaks to the broader mindset that the RSF and that Hamedi has. You know, if, if you speak to him and if you get readouts of, of his meetings, Hamedi is always saying, I'm being blamed for everything. The Sudanese armed forces are blaming me for attacks that take place. I'm always the one being blamed for this. He really sees himself as really the victim in all of this. I think that is hard to sometimes conceptualize, right? Because he is involved in a lot of corruption and his forces commit many atrocities. And so that dichotomy is very difficult to understand. But I think once you spend a long time interviewing and speaking with RSF soldiers and even Hamedi yourself, you get a sense of his worldview. And that's a sense of victimhood that I think is really fundamental to understanding how he operates and his perception and his actions. The current clashes are the culmination of days of escalations. On the 13th of April 2023, the Sudanese army issued a warning to the RSF. They warned against any deployment of RSF troops in Khartoum without their approval. This comes just a day after the Sudanese military surrounded a small force of RSF in Merawi in the north of Sudan, who'd strayed too close to military planes belonging to Sudan and Egypt. This resulted in a standoff. Witnesses told Reuters that gunfire was heard in Merawi on Saturday the 15th, and on news reports you can see smoke rising from a military base in the city. The independence of the RSF is not just militarily, and its mentality, as described by Justin. According to Global Witness, RSF have also tried to achieve financial independence from the state. And they have achieved this through the capture of Sudan's gold industry. A human rights lawyer based in the region spoke to the GI and said that Hermeti had, and I quote, built gold mines on human skulls and graves. Gold is essential to the survival of the RSF. Here's Khaloud. Having the contacts that the RSF has, being both a formal and informal organisation, they are able to transfer gold, they're able to mine for gold, they're able to buy gold from artisanal miners very easily compared to, for example, other economic rents that that might be available. But it's not just the RSF that has relied on gold to maintain its, its operations, but with the RSF's control very much over Darfur, um, it has been able to lay claim and continue to control many of the gold mines in Darfur something which the government of Sudan is less able to do. And in even in other parts of the, the country, for example, in places like South Kordofan and Blue Niles, we have seen an encroachment, particularly since the coup, and particularly since the year before that, the peace agreement of 2020. We have seen Hemeti use his new connections to the former rebels through the peace agreement to open up their territories in Darfur, South Kordofan, Blue Nile, in order to access gold mines there. So, you know, his reg- his sort of power has enabled him to access gold and the gold has enabled him to remain in power. So I would say it's actually quite essential to his operation. The RSF control gold mines in a few places in Sudan, including the famous Jabal Amer in Darfur, which they seized from a commander of the Janjaweed and rival of Hameti, Musa Hilal. Here's Mo Hashim again. He is a tribal Arab chief from North Darfur. He's supposed to be somehow related to Muhammad Hamdan Dagalop. And at the time, in around the... 2010-11, Musa Hilal was a minister in Bashir's government. He was also the commander of the border force. And he had under his control a gold mine in an area called Jabal Amir. Now, Himeti has always had his eye on Jabal Amir. Somehow, he's managed to differences between him and Musa Hilal reached a point where their forces were fighting. Hemeti manages to neutralize Musa Hilal. Hilal is then sent to jail. And uh, Hemeti's rapid support forces seize control of Jabal Amer. Jabal Amer, along with other gold mines, made Hemeti one of the richest men in Sudan and at the head of the most ruthless force in the country. 
Such was his wealth that during the crisis that eventually led to Bashir's removal from power, Hameti said this. Here, Hameti and the RSF was offering over $1 billion to the central bank of Sudan. Now, to utilise his newfound wealth, Hameti and the RSF created some companies to control the gold industry. And Hameti's immediate family have been major beneficiaries of this. But here, I want to focus on just one company, a gold trading company called El Geneid, which incidentally is owned by one of Hameti's brothers, who is also the deputy head of the RSF. Global Witness did an excellent investigation into this called Breaking the Bank. I'll put a link to it in the podcast notes. But let me just give a brief overview. El Geneid Gold Company is owned by three members of Hermeti's family, his brother and his brother's two sons. It's alleged that Hermeti sits on the board of directors, although El Geneid deny his involvement. According to a Reuters investigation in late 2018 over a four-week period, El Geneid sent around $30 million of gold bars to Dubai. And leaked documents have indicated that there are strong financial links between the RSF and El Geneid including a spreadsheet that indicates that the RSF paid $14,000 for the debts of El Geneid. Again, the company has denied any connection between El Geneid and RSF. Now, remember that RSF maintained control over Jabel Amer in Darfur. Well, the company who gained the only large concession in the region was, yep, El Geneid. Just a few weeks ago, in an interview with a local radio station, a protester accused El Geneid of monopolising thousands of kilometres and called for the opening up of the whole area to all companies. And this is just one area that they're active in. Researching this kept bringing up the same question for me. If this is all so widely known, what do Sudanese citizens actually think about it? Here's Justin Lynch. I think one of the really interesting things about Sudanese politics and Sudanese society is that the crime is known to everybody, right? It's not a secret that Hamedi has a huge influence over gold, that his family is involved, and that there is huge corruption going on. This is because many of the businesses in Sudan also are accused of corruption. And this is a, in many ways, what has come out of a political and regulatory system that has no real enforcement power. And so I think that if you were to speak to a really common Sudanese person, you know, one of the surprising things that I always find is it's like, yeah, I mean, of course, somebody going to do this, right? I mean, he's a smart guy and he's taking advantage of what he can. And so there's almost like, you know, how can you blame Hamedi for doing this? Because, This is a broader political system with no regulatory enforcement. And so everybody is trying to find a way to skirt this system. And so it's not a surprise at all what Hamedi and his family are doing. It's very well known. El Geneid traded with artisanal miners who make up the vast majority of workers in the gold industry of Sudan. They use chemical products like mercury and cyanide to separate the gold from the rocks, causing serious health conditions in not only the miners, but also those who are exposed to the poisonous water that can contaminate local watercourses. El Geneid used to collect the leftovers, the byproduct of artisanal mining, the piles of soil called tailings. This is gathered and taken to a processing plant. It's a process called heap leaching which means that the tiny and microscopic pieces of gold are separated from other minerals using a cyanide solution, which binds itself to the gold. The solution then passes through some channels and can be recovered from what's called a pregnant pond. And then the whole cycle can begin again. Using cyanide recovers about 70% of the gold, whereas using mercury recovers around 30%. Some artisanal miners in Nyala, South Darfur, staged a protest against the mining practices of El Geneid. 
One of the protesters said that the mining had caused the spread of diseases and the deterioration of the environment, pointing to ponds that violate specifications and mining laws using toxic mercury and cyanide, and called for the use of safe methods. This is just one example of protests about this technique and the environmental damage that it's done. Nyala, incidentally, is another location that reports of violence had erupted over the last few days, with the Sudanese armed forces claiming to have maintained control of Nyala International Airport after an attack by the RSF. So now we have a spanner in the works, the current clashes between the military and the RSF. What will this mean for the RSF and its control over large swathes of the gold industry? Wadi El Singer is a remote part of the Nile state in north northeast of Sudan. And in March 2018, a small group of workers had gathered at the gold mining site to protest a government deal. A few months earlier, in late October 2017, the Minerals Minister, Professor Hashim Ali Salim, signed a gold prospection agreement with a company called Meroe Gold. The person to sign the agreement on behalf of Meroe Gold was regional director Mikhail Potepkin, who, according to the US Department of the Treasury, is also the regional director of another company, M Invest. Yes, that Wagner affiliated company we heard about earlier. The area Merawi had been granted was Wadi Elsinger. The protesters said that the land granted to Merawi was theirs and that they hadn't been consulted at all prior to the agreement being signed. As the protesters descended on the mine, it was reportedly guarded by Sudanese police and Russian guards, including, according to protesters, a sniper. Suddenly, without warning, the guards fired on the protesters, killing one, Al-Habob Farah, and injuring five others. The state governor claimed that the protesters began to attack the company. Here's Khaloud. Despite the fact that there were shockwaves around the country from the story, we actually saw very little in terms of a response from the authorities. What I think may have happened is that under sort of Sudanese criminal law, when a crime has been committed, particularly murder, the family can be given a monetary compensation in order to sort of guarantee that they won't seek prosecution. So I think that's something that may have been brokered by the Bashir regime to ensure that their Russian friends didn't receive any sort of backlash from that. But I think what is the outcome of that has been that because there is a more of a readiness in Sudan to protest gold mining activities by not just Wagner, but also Sudanese figures. And there have been increasingly more protests against the environmental and health impacts of the gold industry on local communities and artisanal miners, that I think that there is a bit more caution by Wagner in particular around committing such acts. This was the start of Wagner's journey through Meroe into Sudanese gold. Here's Mo Hashim again. We started all realizing that when Omar al-Bashir went on and, and met Putin and started talking about this whole talk about a potential base on the Red Sea and that they needed some people to come and train, we started seeing some videos on social media of what appeared as Russian operatives, but they were not Russian military operatives. They were not people who were wearing uniform, but they were Russians who were training Sudanese forces. These were people dressed in civilian clothes and working. By that time, we knew about Wagner's existence in Syria and in Libya, and people in Khartoum were talking that, okay, these guys are here. There is a unit that's looking after Bashir, looking after his own Bashir security. We know their houses in Khartoum. There are these locations. There were all these leaks. And the chatter was just a lot of it coming up. After the revolution post-2019, we started receiving more confirmed information about where these individuals are based, the type of work that they were carrying out. We started seeing them in 2019, during the uprising, these private military contractors. We started seeing their vehicles deployed in downtown Khartoum. We started seeing their personnel advising the security forces from how to contain crowds. We started seeing footage of of individuals that started being reported. It's starting more and more to emerge until 
the last evident footage of these types of interventions was during the coup of 2021, when various sources were reporting sightings of, of these Russian operatives. The footprint extended to things that we're seeing within the Sudanese social media pages, the creation of all these bots and accounts that were promoting the military's narrative, that were promoting Russia's position. And there is so much evidence. We're seeing it in clear sight, but we can't pinpoint it because it's risky business for anyone to go and do this type of journalism in Sudan. If you're implicated, you could easily be liquidated or disappear. There is so much information surrounding this story that I think it's best splitting the episode in two. This episode we've spoken a lot about the RSF and Hameti. This was to help you understand how the gold industry operates in Sudan. But with the current violence, one thing to consider is what this means for Wagner, who allegedly work with both sides of this conflict. And we'll explore this in more detail in the next episode when we look at the ways in which Wagner has infiltrated the gold industry in Sudan and how it operates in other parts of Africa, and the cache of leaked documents directly from Wagner. That's it for part one of this episode of Deep Dive from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. I'd like to thank Mo, Holud, Ken, Justin and Jason for being part of this podcast. If you want to read the GI report, The Grey Zone, Russia's Military, Mercenary and Criminal Engagement in Africa, it's available in the podcast notes, as is a link to the GI's different observatories, including East and Southern Africa and also Ukraine. You can check out the incredible research going on around the world and you'll also find an extensive list of research material for this episode. And just one more thing, whilst busily working away on this episode, something was announced in the US. The Department of Treasury will be designating Wagner as a significant transnational criminal organization under Executive Order 13581 as amended. We'll have to talk about that. This has been Deep Dive from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. I'm Jack Megan Vickers. Thanks for listening. <laughs>